Thank you for turning to page 121. Okay, welcome back to page 121. Here is part two of the uh, run-through on the module WG-5 Mordekainen's Fantastic Adventure set in the world of Greyhawk. Just as before, there are spoilers in this. If you plan on playing in this module or running this module, you now would be a good time to turn this video off. I am going to be giving up some spoilers. Also at the end, I'm going to give up a little bit more history of Mauer Castle and specifically other items that uh, developed further on this module and on the abandoned Mauer Castle in the world of Greyhawk. So let's get started. Okay, the module cover unfolds. It's a nice gatefold cover as they did in the old modules for uh, all three levels of the dungeon. Level one we did last video uh, with the terrible Iron Golem, which is just one of my favorite encounters in all of D&D. And this one follows levels two and three. We get to meet Eli Tomorest, uh, the mage who's kind of in charge of the place, maybe? And, of course, the evil demon Curzit. I think somebody was watching a little Sesame Street when they came up with the name Curzit the Demon, but uh, it's fun nonetheless. It's kind of neat the way uh, Eli's character is developed because he's definitely in charge of the mundane creatures in here, the uh, various soldiers that are in here, and he sacrifices to Curzit, but there's a little bit of question as to who the big dog is. Is it Eli or is it Curzit? Uh, I developed it actually that it was Curzit. It was kind of fun. So we're going to go ahead and go a uh, quick run through of the actual uh, key to encounters. And then we're going to go ahead and touch on a little bit of the background of this module, uh, what it did in my campaign, and then some other sources for this module. So, <clears throat> going to level two. Key to the second level. There's a lot of fun encounters in this one. We get to meet a new monster who appears later in the module called Eturg, T-Y-R-G. This may be an old school one now, but then it was new. It was pretty neat. We, uh, it's an interesting tiger-dog mix, and it howls and causes you losses on initiative and in combat. Uh, there are guards in room 21 that will hear uh, the Turg putting up its noise and then come join the fight as well. So, pretty hack and slash. Pretty straightforward if your party is uh, of you know decent power and has their heads together. This will be a fun encounter, but shouldn't be any great problem for them. Uh, we come into uh, room 22, which has a tapestry. The tapestry is interesting because it gives the some interest and some back uh, story on the city of lost lost city of the elders, uh, located in a dimension usable by. Uh, only by a certain dagger that Curzit has. This was an expansion to this original uh, module. I'm sure it was expansion to the campaign. Uh, big thing in old school D&D was pocket dimensions, which would have their own uh, dungeon or city or whatever, where the players could get wonders that were beyond what you could gain in a worth. <clears throat> it's not really uh, the Lost City of the Elders is not expanded on in this module. It's left for you to do it. Uh, it's it's fun. Coming down a hallway, uh, not a ton of interest here. There's an occupied room, uh, which has Eli Tomarest's right hand man in it. He's an uh, eighth level magic user, Lord Huben. Lord Huben. Uh, it's an interesting encounter, as is typical in the old school D and D. If you catch the magic user quick before he can cast spells, you win. It does have his list of spells, and he's got some interesting magic items, including a new item that was new in this uh, adventure called the Dust of Dullness, which is dealt with later in the adventure. Coming down to room 25, it's a storage room. As in the old school modules, lots of stuff is detailed in here. Good place for the player characters to stock up on salt and wine and cheese. Uh, coming to a chest room, uh, you get some nice treasure in here, mostly cash. <clears throat> this module is not uh, flooding you with magic, but then that's okay. If you're high enough level to get into this dungeon and survive it, you should have enough magic to keep you going anyway. Okay, 
Going to 27, it's a dead end that leads to a secret corridor bringing you down to number 3. Uh, number 28, the stinking chamber. Uh, the floor here is uh, basically there's a pit over in the corner that bubbles out acid. The acid pops out. Uh, that's the actual encounter in 29, the unwholesome pool. The acid pops out and causes damage. And then every 0 to 9 rounds, it'll burst up and cause 4 to 16 for anybody in the area. It's kind of nasty. There's uh, no saving throw kind of situation. It's just an area to avoid. The Chamber of Fumes. <clears throat> this one's nasty. There's a fire pit underneath the floor. If you walk on the, uh, on the floor, the fire pit beneath has weakened the floor. And uh, as the illustration shows, the floor gives way. You fall into the fire pit and take a ton of damage. The Room of Robes. This one's kind of nasty. Hidden among the, uh, this is number 31, hidden among the robes is a specter. Uh, kind of surprising. Specters are very, very uh, tough and uh, at this level can cause quite a bit of damage since they drain levels. And this is first edition D&D, which means they literally drain your ability to do things. Uh, this could be a fun encounter. It uh, was in my game, although they did see the white, uh, or I'm sorry, the specter. Uh, early enough that uh, they were able to deal with it without losing any levels. We come down here to the special guard room. These are fanatics that follow uh, Eli Tomarest and uh, will fight to the death for him. That's a pretty good hack and slash encounter. You got a storeroom, a heavy door, a weapons practice area. All this is just, and then the long corridor, you're getting into pretty standard uh, dungeon fare here. Lots of description of not much to do. Uh, you get to the Black Hand. Uh, it's a hexagonal room with a an imprint of a Black Hand in the center. Anyone touching it gets instantaneous mental contact with another being, which is kind of neat because 1 through 3, it's Eli Tomarest. He knows you're coming. 4 and 5, it's Cursed the Demon, which is even worse. And then number 6, one of the party members. It only lasts for a few rounds, but it's kind of an interesting... Uh, con uh, way to give out some uh, exposition on Tomarast or Kurzit as they are in your head and they're, they're extolling their evil plan and that kind of thing. It was a, a good way to, to bring out some of the details. You get to the round chamber. This is Eli Tomarast, wizard, artificer, and madman. He's a 14th level magic user. He's very formidable. Uh, he has some special powers uh, through his hands which uh, were removed and replaced with strange appendages. They were grafted onto him, presumably from a demon. Uh, they can strike in melee for uh, doing extra damage, and it's a melee blow. The left hand can improve his dexterity by two points, uh, dropping his armor class, increasing his uh, reaction time. The right hand can improve his chance to hit when he's holding a weapon. And then both hands give him pretty good defense. Uh, the problem is, you know, if he clasps his hands in defense, well, he's basically kind of just standing there getting hit. He does gain 4 to 24 uh, phantom hit points, but this isn't really going to help him survive the encounter. Uh, I ran Eli <clears throat> is very, very intelligent, very hard to lock down into a melee. Uh, he used illusions and his uh, dimension door to move around a great deal. They had a hard time actually coming to grips with him. When they finally did, they were able to beat him. But I would play him as a very intelligent magic user. If they beat Eli, they get to go ahead and go through his stuff, which is always the, the reason you're in a dungeon, right? To get somebody's stuff. Uh, lots of nice details here. There's a rug that animates and causes some damage. Uh, mostly uh, non-magical treasure to be had here. Uh, there is a nice chunk on his history of uh, on, on Tomarest's actual history itself. How he came to Mauer Castle ten years ago. Uh, he wanted to learn. He's here to learn all kinds of stuff. Uh, anything he can get his hands on, he's learned. Uh, he also wants to... Uh, he has a pseudo-religion going based on Kurzit the Demon, where he has his followers sacrificed to Kurzit. He tells them it's a religious thing. Kurzit's a deity. Really... He has to sacrifice to Kurzit in order to get into the area where Kurzit's guarding and gain a magic item I'll talk about in a little bit. 
it's kind of an interesting interaction between the two because initially you think Eli Tomarast is the main villain of the module and the uh, chief bad guy, but when you really kind of go into this a little bit, it's more Curzit than anything else. Uh, it's, it's just an interesting uh, dichotomy between the two. Uh, we go out of Eli's area. There's various peak holes that allow you uh, things to look through uh, to know you're coming. This be good places for the guards to be so they can be ready for you. Uh, the next area, the work-study area, uh, this is the area where Rel, who is kind of Eli Tomaras familiar, uh, he's a, cyclo a dwarven cyclops, which is kind of neat. He's two feet tall, umber tint to his skin, wearing light chain. He's got a pendant of invisibility, uh, nice diamond worth 5,000 gold. And, uh, I don't know, it, it's an interesting encounter once you've gotten past Tomarast. Uh, this is a little bit of an anticlimax. Uh, I actually rolled this guy in working with Tomarast to make the actual encounter with him a little tougher. That worked better, I felt. Uh, was definitely more challenge for them. So then you go through, uh, Rel stuff, and you pop through the peak holes. There's the old prison room. Uh, the old prison room. Uh, they've got a prisoner who is a uh, merchant in the area uh, who they're doing nasty things to just because they want to. The two torturers here are really assassins. They will split off first chance they get and uh, go around and try to pick off the player characters as they adventure through the dungeon. This can be tough a tough encounter. My players ended up uh, actually following the assassins and finishing them before it really became much of anything. Uh, you come around to the uh, Chamber of Black Smoke. There are slow shadows in here. This is a new monster also in this adventure. Slow shadows are interesting. They're a type of shadow, but they attach to you and start draining your hit points, making you feel cold. They're, they're detailed later in the module. They're, they're fun. The Mud Room is an encounter I did not use. This is just a massive dump of brown mold. Uh, if you get anywhere near it, you take 4 to 24 points of damage. No saving throw. I'm not a big fan of no saving throw anythings. Uh, it's, I didn't use the encounter. You get to the fighter's headquarters. This is a good chance to just go ahead and do some hack and slash. It's a nice little brawl, uh, with, uh, nine fighters. And, uh, it's just a fun little fight. Then you get to the purple stone. The purple stone's kind of interesting. Uh, when you get within two to five feet of it, a light shines on you. Uh, based on your intelligence, you gain different powers that last for a limited time. Uh, this was a, an interesting encounter. I kind of wish the module had explained a little more as to what this thing is. Uh, I guess that's meant for the Dungeon Master to expand on, but it just seemed to me that it needed a few more questions answered. Um, if, however, you attack this stone, for whatever reason you would choose to, uh, it's only armor class 3 and 32 hit points, but it immediately blasts you and with a feeble mind against which there is no saving throw, and it does it because it knows you're going to do it. It does it before you can do it, attack it, I thought this was kind of a strange encounter. I used the power aspect of the Purple Stone. My players are not Murder Hobo. They didn't end up uh, attacking the thing. Okay, going to level three. Again, lots of uh, standard dungeon uh, crawl stuff in here. Uh, you go through the secret room. You get to the Null Room. 16 Nulls. Not much of a challenge if you've gotten this far on the adventure, unless you're really torn up. But still, it's 16 nulls. That's fun. You get to a storeroom. Uh, got a good chance for you to uh, re-up your supplies if you're running low. Uh, refuse pit. I stuck an Atiog down here. I made for a fun encounter. Uh, you get to an empty room. And then you get to the red-lit chamber. Um, this is uh, another place where there's a bunch more nulls. The nulls will come fight in the null room for number 49 if they hear it. This is just another hack and slash encounter. Uh, you get to number 54, the junk room. The junk room have eight coal chins in there. Coal chilns, sorry, coal chilns. These are a type of demon new to this module. Uh, th these are interesting little monsters. It's just a good uh, combat uh, encounter. Uh, I like this one. You get some nice stuff out of it. There's a cloud, uh, potion of cloud giant strength, treasure finding. Uh, there's some broken swords that have some valuable uh, gems in the hilts. 
that kind of thing. Uh, an iron banded crate that my players spent a lot of time on. Uh, they, the Sword of Ebon Flame is in there, which actually did become uh, a key item for one of my players. Uh, also a new item that's expanded on in this module. Um, you get to the torture chamber. I'm sorry, I misspoke earlier. The, the torture chamber here is where the two killers are. The killers are the assassins. Uh, an interesting encounter. Uh, I don't do a ton of torture chamber stuff in my uh, campaigns. So we, we largely bypassed that. I did it more for the assassins. Uh, coming to the robe room, robe room. These are the robes that they put on. The followers put on before they go into worship. Uh... You come into an antechamber and then into the magic user's room. The magic user's room is kind of an interesting little brawl. There are quite a few magic users in here. They are Shirzig, Blanish, Dovra, and Ixil. They will uh, react as soon as they see the player's characters attack or in the room. They are magic users from 5th level down to 1st. Hogue. Uh, the, who's actually in the in room 60 at the beginning, is the only one with a fireball, and he is just itching to use it. So he will lob his five hit dice fireball at you. These guys, it was like mowing along with these guys. They were down in a hurry. Uh, you get to the chapel, and then the pulpit area, the walkway. Going down the walkway, there's a large marble fresco. And then there's a dressing area where Tomarask readies himself to deal with Kurzit. He has to put on special clothing and do a chant. He does the chant, gets down to the area where the Tome of the Black Heart is. This is the book that Kurzit guards and is kind of the, I made it the purpose that Kurzit's there. He not only guards it, he is of the book. It's part of him. Uh, the players actually ended up taking the Tome and, uh, trying to use it, and found out that wherever they went, Curzit went, well, that's because he was part of the book. I actually was able to make Curzit a pretty good recurring villain out of this. I played him as a very intelligent demon who was bound only by the book. Once the book was in a locale, he was free to move around the locale. I think I made it within a mile of the book. So he was able to generate quite a bit of uh, misery for the players and did so in a consistent manner. The player characters found themselves... Uh, constantly hounded by him, and it was a lot of fun, made for, for a good after campaign, uh, as did the Sword of Ebb and Flame. Uh, coming into the Appendix 1, I've got to admit, when I bought these old modules, one of the first things I'd do would be to cut to the appendices, because I wanted to see the new magic items, the new monsters. Uh, dust of Dullness, which is an interesting little dust, it can, uh, it numbs out your senses up to including a sixth sense. It's kind of nasty. When you get hit with it, you throw a six-sider. If you throw, for instance, a four, that would be touch. You lose touch and everything below it. So touch, hearing, taste, and sight uh, can be quite effective uh, against player uh, character party. Uh, I've used this in other games. I've given it out as a magic item. It's pretty cool. Uh, potion of controlling damage. I really like this potion. Uh, if you drink it, it lasts for standard potion time, three to twenty-four rounds, but removes or reduces any damage caused to you by two points per die, or if it's a, just a one big hit, like a 24-point hit, it takes away a third of the points. So you take less damage for having imbibed this potion. I like this potion quite a bit. Sword of the Ebon Flame is evil. Uh, it gets bonuses versus lawful good alignments. Uh, it's not intelligent and doesn't communicate through empathy. It has no ego. Uh, this was kind of fun. I, I didn't make the evil aspect of the sword very apparent since it has no ego. I let the player characters kind of find it out as the character went on. And then they went through a rather lengthy uh, quest to purge the evil aspect and keep the various powers of the sword. Tome of the Blackheart is pretty cool. Supposedly found in the Valley of the Mage years and years ago. It has all kinds of uh, information in it. Uh, the tome, once out of the Valley of the Mage, was lost. Curzit found it in a shop in the city of Greyhawk. We've all been there. You're in that used bookstore and you find that once-in-a-lifetime thing. Well, that's what Curzit did. He was using this to create, among other things, the golem uh, with the cockatrice whip and the first level and things like that. Also, a dagger that you can use to uh, get yourself to the uh, city of the Elder Gods. 
Uh, there's some other plane travel things in here. I didn't do a ton with that. My players have never responded great to plane travel stuff. A pocket layer here and there they would go for, but not much beyond that. <clears throat> Appendix number two, the new monsters. Nice write-up on Curzon. I like this guy. I used him as a major bad guy in my campaign for a little over a year. He was a lot of fun. And then we come down to the Cold Chillin', the Hetfish, the Slow Shadow, the Turg. I've mentioned all of them earlier in the adventures. And then, of course, the pre-generated characters. As I said in the first video, these are uh, commercialized versions. They have very few magic items. You can play these guys in there, or you can play your own player characters. We used our own. We used some of these guys as NPCs for a while in the City of Greyhawk. Uh, and they still pop up from time to time. But I always like to make my players more important than NPCs. There's Rigby, the Patriarch. So the only other thing we've got left in this uh, particular venture is to go a little bit more into uh, the expansion that was done in this. And uh, I'll do that in just a moment. Okay. Here is an issue of Dungeon they did about 20 years after uh, Module WG-5, Mordekainen's Fantastic Adventure, which expands on Mauer Castle, brings it up to date for then, current edition 3.5. Uh, there is a very nice picture on the cover of that handsome man himself, Eli Tormarest. Uh, the whole module is, is kind of recapitulated here, but there are some items that are expanded on. I have never run this version, uh, although I did enjoy reading it. And then so a new level or two were introduced in this as well. And then as a continuation of that, we had issue 124 of Dungeon Magazine, which featured part of the Age of Worms run, but it was returned to Mauer Castle, this time by Rob Kuntz, uh, which uh, featured some new levels and some new ideas uh, in Mauer Castle. And then we had issue 139, which again returns us to Mauer Castle. Uh, these were fun issues. It was, it was fun to see deeper levels. There's hints of even more levels uh, that uh, weren't expanded on because Dungeon Magazine went kaput about a year after this one was published. Uh, but this was, uh, this was fun. And then the final thing, this was published in March of 2008, the Earth Journal. What the heck is Worth Journal? It's an online fanzine that's still very much in existence. If you just Google the words a Worth Journal, you'll find them for free download. They did a Mauer Castle special edition with even more levels. Mauer Castle is huge, uh, the way it's laid out between the original module, these three dungeon magazines, and the Earth Journal special. Uh, I think everybody was going for a Castle Greyhawk feel. And I think they succeeded. It's a lot of fun. I really like it. We get into more on the Maurer family, who they were, their origins in the Sul Empire, that kind of thing. Uh, I, these are enjoyable. Again, I've never really played these, but since they key off my favorite module, I thought they were worthy of having in my collection. So that's it for this uh, video. I hope you enjoyed the little walk down memory lane and a little bit of new information. And if you liked what you saw, please like and subscribe. Thank you. Well, that closes the book on another episode of page 121. Please leave your comments below, and if you enjoyed what you saw, go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe to the channel.